please welcome to the stage Gil Reyes. I'm sure the woman on the other end of the phone identified herself as being from the clinic I'd been to the day before. Maybe she said her name. Maybe she asked if I was sitting down. I don't remember any of that. In my memory, I just pick up the phone and this voice says, go immediately to the emergency room. Your kidneys are failing. And as I get up and get dressed, there's this voice in the back of my head just saying, this is absurd. I'm in my 20s. I'm invincible. I'm immortal. I don't even need health insurance. I don't even have health insurance. <laughs> sure, I'd been feeling bad for a while, but my swollen ankles, that was because I was waiting tables, working double shifts, trying to save up money, not because my body wasn't processing water waste, right? And these splitting headaches, that was because I was really stressed out, trying to get into grad schools and not because your kidneys regulate your blood pressure. And when I finally collapsed a few days before, I didn't have any more excuses. That was when my boyfriend, Sean, made me go to the clinic. <laughs> Sean and I had been dating for a year, living together for a few months. It was moving a little bit fast, but either of us could go to grad school at any minute, so it was fine. We had sort of a day-by-day -day mentality, and maybe we were keeping each other just at arm's length. In fact, I was able to convince him not to go with me to the emergency room. I mean, why should we both sit around all day for some doctors to tell me that that's not what it is, that it's something else, that it's something that can be fixed with a pill, right? So I went, alone, terrified, but hiding it well. And, uh, and this trait of mine, this sort of crazy independence, maybe at best, uh, stems from when I came out to my uh, southern mother from Alabama, my Baptist mom, my Catholic Hispanic dad from Texas, growing up a teenager in Kentucky. <laughs> if you're thinking this didn't go well, you're right. <laughs> there were Bibles manifesting from nowhere. <laughs> Even though I'd been to church more than they had throughout my life, and there was screaming and yelling, and I left that night thinking, I'm one of the damned. Well, because they told me, you're going to hell. And we didn't speak for a while, over a year. And when we began to try to put our relationship back together, the damage was pretty done. I mean, how close can you get when there's this whole part of your life that somebody wants nothing to do with? I, I remember once my dad, out of the blue, said, I never want to meet anyone you're seeing. I don't ever want you to bring anybody home. But as my emergency room visit became a 10-day ten, ten stay in the hospital, I had to let a lot of people know where I was. In fact, that hospital room was where my parents first met Sean. I learned my kidneys were functioning at less than 10%. I learned that I would probably have to go on dialysis. If you don't know much about dialysis, it's a way to live. It's not a great way to live. It's not pleasant. It's very time consuming. It's expensive. No, what you want in this situation is a living donor, a kidney donor. You could get on the national transplant list. That is going to take time, maybe years, waiting with a bag packed by the door. Um, and cadaver kidneys have other issues with them. Maybe they're not the best choice. If you can get a living donor, though, usually family, somebody who's a perfect match. That's the ideal situation. Well, my relationship with my parents had left me a little bit wounded. I had a little bit of trouble maybe trusting people. This is one of the things I was bad at in my 20s. I, it used to be at the top of the list. Now the top of the list was kidney function. But it was still up there. And I had this trouble of trusting people and accepting help. And if you have trouble accepting help, imagine trying to accept a kidney. People stepped up to get tested. My dad, despite our differences, uh, my mother couldn't. My best friend, his dad, friends from college, high school, work. And there was one more person who really wanted to get tested, Sean. 
Talk about a commitment. <laughs> he eventually wore me down. He said, you know, whatever happens, if we're together or not in the future, if I can do this for you now, I want to. And as the months began to pass, and I did go on dialysis, and my father was disqualified as a donor because of kidney stones, I went on Social Security and food stamps because I was too weak to work, and friends were disqualified for various reasons, and I wasn't going to be going to grad school. I spent a lot of time thinking about how I was going from 20 to 80, what seemed like overnight, comparing blood pressure medicines with my grandmother. <laughs> I spent a lot of time alone, sleeping, mostly, but I remember this one day where I made it out to the park and I was, I was sitting alone and it was a cool day, it was a fall day. And I was praying, meditating, considering this entire process and I found this really strange piece that's hard to describe. I found this kind of acceptance of myself and where I'd been, and I thought, you know, it's fine. If this is what it is, if, if that was it, I'm okay with that. I can die in my 20s. And I stopped praying to get better, and I thought about the thing that I'd want. If I could pray for one thing, it was to feel worthy of that love that I hadn't felt for so long. And I stopped asking for time and thought about time well spent. It was December when Sean called me from work and said, I have an early Christmas present for you. And he was as good a match as my dad. He said, will you let me give you a kidney? And I said, yes. And we spent time well Sean's a big language geek, so we named it. <laughs> Things work better when you name them. Renee, after the renal system. <laughs> and Renatus, for rebirth. We would tell people, we're having a kidney. <laughs> and our friends convinced us to have a party. We had a kidney shower. Sean really wanted to register, but I thought that might be going a little far. <laughs> Nevertheless, people brought us gifts, pajamas for recovering, and bad movies. Sean loves bad movies. And we played games, like Kidney Bean Bingo, and Pin the Kidney on Gill. <laughs> and we got this big red velvet sheet cake shaped like a kidney. And we wore medical masks and we cut it together <laughs> and fed each other pieces and took lots of pictures. And the day of the surgery came in May and they had us both ready and our gurney is ready to go and we're there, we're surrounded by Sean's family and my family, my parents are there. And my mother starts crying. We never talk about this, but we cry the same way. We scrunch up our cheeks in the same way and we hold back those tears and I can see it in her face when she's trying to work something out. And she leans down and takes Sean's hand and says thank you. And I think, I think she's seeing him differently. And maybe she's seeing me differently. And the surgery goes great. And we recover together for weeks and weeks in a strange little honeymoon. <laughs> a year later, we get a card in the mail. Now, it's not unusual for my mother to send cards. She sends cards for the strangest occasions, even though they live 15 minutes away. <laughs> but this one was addressed to Sean. And it said what a blessing he is. And it recognized our anniversary. And they asked us to go to dinner with them, like couples do with their parents. And I never asked for any proof. 
because you're supposed to rely on faith. But I have a family where I have parents and a, a partner, a perfect match, where I had a boyfriend and a 10-inch scar across my abdomen to remind me every day that I am loved. <laughs>